Welcome back. This is Renee Clary and today we will investigate different sedimentary rock types. In an earlier lecture, we looked at weathering and erosion and the formation of sediments. Now, when sediments are compacted and cemented together, a process known as lithification, this results in sedimentary rocks. Sedimentary rocks are the most common type of rock on the Earth's surface, and they're one of our three main rock types. In addition to being directly related to the rock cycle, sedimentary rock formation is governed through plate tectonics. So let's get started. Sedimentary rocks, as you might suspect, would be the most common type of rock on the Earth's surface because it is here on the Earth's surface where weathering processes occur. In the mantle, you don't have the effects of rain, wind, glacial ice, so therefore you aren't forming sediments in the mantle. However, on the Earth's surface, these weathering processes are prevalent and therefore we end up with a lot of sediment. We have sedimentation, deposition, and finally, lithification. Remember that weathering creates the sediment ready to be transported. The sediment comes from pre-existing rocks, and it can be either detrital sediment or pieces of pre-existing rock, but smaller, or we can look at chemical sediment, or those ions that are dissolved in solution, um, atoms held in solution as well. Remember our diagram, we have weathering, which will break down materials at the Earth's surface, erosion, which will remove these, pro these products from their source of weathering, transportation can occur via running water, wind, glacial ice, deposition occurs in various environments, rivers, lakes, marine environments, and finally we end up with sedimentary rock formation when we get compaction and cementation, a process known as lithification. Now sediments can be transported in a variety of ways. We can transport sediments via running water, wind, glaciers, waves, longshore currents. We can also involve suspension in other words, smaller particles that are held in suspension in water, as well as solution. We can dissolve ions and atoms in solution. Now, typically, the longer the transport process, the more rounded the sediment we're going to get. So if we look at the sediments, those that are angular tend to imply that they weren't transported very far. Those that are very well rounded imply transportation, especially in water environments. Here is a diagram that shows not only a solid load for this river, notice that there are big pieces, of course at, at the bottom those can't be carried along in suspension, they're just rolled along in that river channel. There are also some uh, solids that are held in suspension, clay-sized particles, maybe even sand-sized depending on the energy of the river, but the chemical load is dissolved in water. Deposition of sediments can occur in three main environment types, terrestrial or continental, transitional, and a marine environment. As you might suspect, the transitional environment is that environment that is between the continent and the marine environment, so we have a transitional zone. Let's take a look first at different terrestrial environments. Terrestrial environments, whoops, my side jumps, sorry about that. Terrestrial environments or non-marine environments include soil, ah, we're having, we're having technical difficulties here, sorry about that, I'm not sure why my mouse is misbehaving. Okay, we have soil, whoop, <laughs> one more time. We have soils, lakes, lakes can be referred to as lacustrine environments, these are freshwater environments and they typically have fine sediments. We're not looking at, at large um, uh, cobbles that are deposited in lakes. Glacial environments are poorly sorted. Um, this is because the ice does not um, 
round as it transports. Basically, the sediments are transported in the ice and they're frozen until they get to their destination. So we tend to see uh, poorly sorted and angular sediments in glacial environments. In fluvial or riverine river environments, we have a wide variety of sediments. We can also have volcanic depositional environments. Ah, there we go. Okay, here is a block diagram that shows the three main environment types. We can focus briefly on the terrestrial ones. And as you see up at the top of that block, we have a stream environment, a glacial environment, a lake environment, we can have sand dunes, alluvial fans, a deposition when, um, when water reaches its terminus. Uh, usually alluvial fan deposition occurs at the base of mountains. Transitional environments involve uh, those environments which are at the edge of the continental environment and include a marine component as well. Uh, beaches, barrier islands, deltas, and organic reefs are all transitional environments. We have marine environments, and this is where a lot of deposition occurs. Um, the marine environment can be further subdivided. The shelf, the continental shelf, we tend to see a progression from coarser sediments to finer sediments as we move farther from the shore. There is a continental slope, and then we also have an abyssal area. Um, the abyssal area doesn't get much sedimentation from the continent except through turbidity currents which result in graded bedding, and we'll take a look at that later in this lecture. Okay, back at our block diagram, here are the transitional environments. Note the tidal flat, the delta, the beach, the lagoon. We have a large marine environment, and we will see a progression of uh, sediments from the shore toward the deeper water, usually uh, sandstones, shales and limestones being formed and you can see that submarine fan uh, down from the slope down into the abyss. Uh, sediments become unstable and they flow down the slope very rapidly very similar to a river delta on the, um, the base of the seafloor. Okay, but we have sediments. What happens to the sediments to form sedimentary rocks? As already noted, sediments form sedimentary rocks through the process known as lithification. And this involves compaction of the sediments and reduction of the pore space. And it also involves cementation. The compaction can be caused from the weight of the overburden as more and more sediments are deposited on top of the first sediments, this uh, basically reduces the, the pore space, flattens them out a bit, and the, um, the uh, pores get smaller and smaller. So they're being, the rock is, the, uh, excuse me, the sediments are being compacted. Cementation involves the chemical precipitation of minerals in pore space, uh, or cement, and the cement can be um, calcium carbonate, calcite, um, SiO2, silica, and we can have some, um, some rare cements as well, uh, including um, pyrite, for example. We have two basic types of sedimentary rocks, as you might suspect from our two basic types of weathering processes. We have what are known as detrital sedimentary rocks, and detrital sedimentary rocks consist of pieces from pre-existing rocks that are cemented together. We also have chemical sedimentary rocks, and we'll discuss those next. But first, let's talk about detrital sedimentary rocks, and these do consist of particles or detritus of rocks that have been weathered, and the particle size can vary. These rocks have what are known as a clastic texture. Remember, we classify all rocks on the basis of texture and composition. And this texture for a detrital sedimentary rock is a clastic texture. The detrital sedimentary rocks are classified primarily by size. So we have gravel, the large pieces that are greater than two millimeters in diameter. We have sand, which is two millimeters to about a sixteenth of a millimeter. And then we have mud, which forms mud rocks, and we can have uh, we can further subdivide that and get a silt that is one sixteenth to one two hundred and fifty sixth 
of a millimeter. So we're talking very, very small. And finally, we can have clay-sized particles that are smaller than 1 to 56 of a millimeter. Now, this is a very basic size classification. Um, if you ever take a petrology class, for example, you will learn that we don't just um, classify things as sand. There are lots of different sand classifications. So this is a very simplistic overview. I do have some sediment sizes to show you. And I brought three samples. I did want to bring a whole bunch of them. Um, this is a very fine sediment. Let me turn it to the side. And as I move it, you can see those very fine little particles that are left behind on the wall of the little container. So this would be um, a mud-sized particle, very, very tiny. Now, compare that to this which is a sand size and if we look at it this way you can see that we you know we have bigger pieces and I brought some gravel as well so here are three different types of, uh, of sediment sizes um, but we can have a, a lot more there are a lot of intermediate sizes obviously and all of these examples that I've brought today um, are pretty well sorted meaning that in each of these containers, they're all about the same size. We don't have sand mixed in with this gravel, for example. Okay, let's go back to the slides and look at this classification of sedimentary particles table. And this summarizes what we just talked about, but I want you to note that clay here refers to a size. Clay can also refer to a type of mineral. We have different clay minerals that are weathered, for example, from granite. So you have to be careful in geology. What are we referring to here? Are we talking to the si about the size of a particle, or are we talking about the type of mineral that's involved? Now this is an old diagram, but I think it's absolutely great. It shows varying sizes of sediment, and if we start at the bottom, you see a clay-sized sediment, which is smaller than 1 2 of a millimeter, and then let's follow that across. We have um, compaction, and we end up with um, a shale, and then we have a silt right above that, a silt-sized particle. If it is compacted, we end up with a siltstone. A sand-sized particle, 2 millimeters to 1 16th of a millimeter, can be compacted and cemented, and that would result in a sandstone. We have to be careful with the term sand as well. Um, note that sand is a size of sediment, but usually when we refer to sandstone, we're talking about quartz sandstone or silicon dioxide sandstone. Uh, so we have to be a little bit careful there as well to know that we're either talking about a size only or whether we're referring to uh, sand as well as a mineral um, quartz sand. Gravel, the big particles greater than two millimeters in diameter, we can have compaction and cementation, but because of the shape of the individual particles, we can end up with two different rocks. We can have what are known as a conglomerate or a breccia. A conglomerate has rounded clasts, whereas a breccia has more angular clasts. So let's go on that line a little bit further. Um, not only do we classify detrital sedimentary rocks by the size of the particles, we can also look at the shape of the particles, particularly when we get to those gravel-sized particles. A conglomerate would have rounded particles, and a breccia would have angular um, particles. And depending on um, the particle, again, we can kind of tell a little bit about its history. And the more weathering and transportation a particle undergoes, the more rounded the particle we see. I have some samples here to show you. This is a conglomerate, and you can see that it has um, pebble sizes that have been cemented together. And I stuck this one in a rock saw, and you can see the individual uh, pebbles a little bit better this way. Now, compare this with a breccia and see the difference in roundedness of particles. The breccia has much more angular particles. Take a look at this inclusion particularly. Look how angular that is. Now, based on that last statement, 
that I made in the slide, uh, which one do you think has undergone more weathering and, uh, and transportation. Now, I'm not talking about the rock. Um, I'm talking about the particles included in the rock. And you should note that these inclusions, these clasts, are much more rounded than these in the Brescia. So it appears, it's obvious, that the clasts here have been weathered more, they've been transported farther from the source than the clasts here. Um, these have not been transported very far from the source of the rock before they have been uh, compacted and cemented together. Okay, conglomerate versus breccia. Now, in addition to um, looking at the shape of particles, we can also uh, look at the composition. Let's go back to that. We can classify by composition, and I made a note of that a little earlier, that um, you know we refer to sand, and usually we mean quartz sand. But that's not always the case. We can have sand-sized particles that make up a rock that are not quartz. For example, an arcose is a rock that contains 25% or more uh, felspar. And I have a couple of samples to show you there as well. Here is a uh, quartz sandstone. We can actually see some nice bedding planes in this. Look at that. So this is quartz sandstone, and this would be an arcose. This contains some, um, some felspar. Now, how would you tell that apart? And don't say color. <laughs> the way you would look at this and tell it apart is by looking at the individual um, clasts of the rock, and you would do that with a hand lens. It would be pretty hard to tell this uh, from just looking at the rock. I've seen many sandstones this color and almost this texture. There is a slight textural difference um, between an arcose and a quartz sandstone, um, but you would have to look at those individual grains with a hand lens to determine whether whether or not this is a, um, a, an arcose versus a quartz sandstone. I have some pictures to show you of these as well. Here you see um, the conglomerate up in the upper left um, of the slide, and that is being weathered. We get uh, the, uh, the breakdown of that conglomerate. And that is overlying sandstone in that same photograph. And then to the lower right, we see the breccia. The breccia is uh, very angular in fragments. That in particular is a volcanic breccia, and that forms as lava moves over unconsolidated material and picks it up. So um, the particles are very, very angular. They have not been weathered. Here are some more photographs. There is a, a quartz sandstone down in the lower right and compare that to the arcosic sandstone which is in the upper left. Here is a shale exposure in Tennessee. Um, remember, shales are made from clay-sized particles, and it's not a shale. It can be a claystone. It's not a shale until we have a fissile uh, rock type, and this means that those layers break along regular bedding planes. Note how we have those really uh, nice planes being exposed in that outcrop. That means that this rock is fissile. This is shale. Now, chemical sedimentary rocks are formed by chemical precipitation from solution. So, imagine you're doing a science exper experiment at home right now. Get a glass of water and go ahead and add table salt or halite to that glass of water and stir it up and sit it down. Put a sign in front of it that says, science experiment, do not disturb. Leave it alone for six months. When you come back, what do you see? Where's the water? Well, the water should have been evaporated. Where does it go? When water evaporates, it moves into the atmosphere. The water in the atmosphere is called humidity, and if you live in a place like Mississippi or Louisiana, you know that we have a lot of water in our air. Where's the salt that you initially dissolved in that glass. It's actually at the bottom of the glass. It's recrystallized.
That is another way that sedimentary rocks can form, and that is a chemical sedimentary rock type. We can have biochemical sedimentary rocks, and biochemical sedimentary rocks mean that an organism was involved. For example, we can have um, an organism involved in the precipitation of limestone or chert. For example, a siliceous ooze uh, would form a chert. Coal is formed from the compaction and uh, subsequent alteration of plant material, some animal material, but primarily plant material. We can also have evaporites and evaporites or inorganics. This is where the salt precipitates out, like in our science experiment. We can precipitate gypsum, remember sheetrock? Okay, gypsum, halite, chert. Ah, haven't we seen that before? Limestone, we've seen that one before too. So chert and limestone may be formed either through the intervention of an organism or from precipitation of an oversaturated solution. Let's look at limestone and dolestone varieties. Limestone, of course, is uh, CaCO3, calcium carbonate, and dolestone has some magnesium substitution, so we have a calcium-magnesium um, calcium carbonate. When the calcium carbonate or the uh, calcium-magnesium carbonate is precipitated, we can get a travertine, and I have a sample to show you. Travertine is often precipitated around um, hydrothermal um, areas, <coughs> excuse me, such as uh, hot springs. We see a lot of travertine formation, for example, at uh, Mammoth Springs in the Yellowstone area. And this is because the, um, the water starts to cool and there is too much um, calcium carbonate dissolved in the water, so it starts to precipitate out, and the resulting rock type is travertine. Okay, we can also have a different type of um, precipitation. And let's move back, there we go. Um, an oolitic limestone, and this forms when we basically have um, calcium carbonate precipitated around a small object, let's say a small grain of sand, or perhaps a little shell fragment, and over time we get layer upon layer of calcium carbonate buildup, um, almost like you uh, would think of a pearl forming. And this results in a type of limestone called oolitic limestone, and I have a sample of that as well to show you. Here is an oolitic limestone. Now, from your view, you may say, I don't see those individual pieces. They're there. Um, we may have to take a hand lens to it, but they tend to be pretty well rounded. The little individual um, spherules are called ooids. Okay, and I have a picture of that to show you as well. This is an oolitic limestone, and that upper right-hand photograph shows you the individual little ooids. Now, often these form in um, very warm marine areas, and the calcium carbonate starts to precipitate around a little object, like a, a sand or maybe a little shell fragment. And then, under the hot sun, as water evaporates uh, from the surface of, of um, of the ocean, the beach area, uh, we tend to get a concentration of calcium carbonate, so we get more deposition and these little ooids grow. Here's another type of um, limestone. This is obviously organic. This is a coquina, and it's composed primarily of shell fragments that are um, cemented together, and I have a sample to show you of that as well. You can see all the little bitty shell fragments. There's not a whole lot of cement here. It's mostly fragments, and the fragments are organic. So this is a biochemical sedimentary rock. What happens if the little individual um, pieces or the individual shells are very, very tiny? Well, let's take a look. We can end up with deposition of chalk. Um, this is the White Cliffs of Dover. And that chalk, remember chalk's a very soft mineral, was formed by the 
countless bodies of these little bitty coccoliths, uh, coccolithus pelagicus, which deposited on the bottom of the seafloor and accumulated uh, slowly over time to form um, the chalk layer. Now we can also have um, bigger fossils included in limestone, and at that point we just call it fossiliferous limestone. I have a sample from an old rock kit, actually, one of our rock and mineral kits, and this one um, shows some little shell fragments. So we do have limestone, there is some cement here, some calcium carbonate cement, and we do have different fossils that are included in that limestone. So when you see a limestone with uh, obvious fossils in it, we call that, or we refer to that as fossil fossiliferous limestone. Okay. We have um, other types of chemical sedimentary rocks as noted. We don't necessarily have to have um, an organism involved. We can have sedimentary rocks that are the result of supersaturated solutions, no organisms, and um, we call these evaporites. We can get rock gypsum, rock salt, for example, and I have some pictures and some samples to show you. This is rock salt. How would I know that salt? Well, the obvious thing to do is to uh, taste it. It's very salty. Okay. Gypsum. I have another one to show you. Gypsum, rock gypsum, can form also in evaporating environments. Here's a big slab of gypsum. Remember the mineral, uh, we get a nice fine variety that is easily scratched with your fingernail. Uh, this one has a cement to it. Uh, there's something else going on with this rock, so it's not very easily scratched. But this is calcium sulfate. It is a sulfate in the mineral group, and um, it formed from the evaporation of a supersaturated water. Okay, what else can we see with evaporates? We also get chert, and again, this can be either a, um, a chemical sedimentary rock that is uh, biochemical in nature. We can have little microorganisms whose little uh, tests or little shells are made of um, silica, and they die and fall to the seafloor, much in the same manner as that um, chalk we investigated just a, um, a few minutes ago. And chert can also be precipitated from a super concentrated solution. So we can get an evaporite uh, with chert as well. And here is an example I brought to show you. This is a sample of chert. Um, chert is silicon dioxide, and just as we identify quartz by its fracture, remember it has a conchoidal fracture. It looks like broken coke glass. Let me turn this over for you. I think you can see that we don't have any cleavage planes here. Instead, we have uh, fracture. It does have that nice little conchoidal fracture. This is chert. It's the uh, same composition as quartz, SiO2, um, but the um, arrangement of the molecules is, is slightly different, so it's a variety of quartz. We can have uh, coal forming as well. Um, now, coal would involve a uh, biochemical process, so that would be a biochemical sedimentary rock. Here are some photographs. Um, that is not water and that is not ice. Instead, what you're looking at is what is referred to as a playa, P-L-A-Y-A, -A, a playa lake. And this is um, an ephemeral lake, if you will, in a desert area. So during a precipitation event, when we have water coming down from the, uh, the mountains, and you see that in the background, um, that water, is that runoff, is carrying uh, pieces, sediments, uh, rocks that are deposited at the base of the mountains, but as it moves on further into the plain, it's moving into a, a depression, it's carrying a lot of ions in solution that were dissolved out via chemical weathering from those rocks in the mountains. So the water runs into the basin, but we're in a desert. So the water quickly evaporates and leaves behind the minerals that were included or that were carried along in solution as that water came down from the mountain. So what you're looking at in that photograph are the precipitated minerals in that lake bed. And there is a photograph of halite to the right. That is a core of rock salt. That is how salt forms. Um, we get seawater, sea for example, can spill over into a basin and evaporate if the 
um, input of water is less than the evaporation rate and the minerals are left behind as precipitates. So imagine as the Gulf of Mexico formed that we had spillover of uh, the now Atlantic Ocean or the Pacific into that forming basin and the water evaporated, a lot of water evaporated because seawater is only about uh, what 4% uh, salt by, by weight, by volume and um, the water evaporated and left behind salt and then of course more seawater spills and more evaporation occurs so much so that we have a thousand meters of salt underlying the Gulf of Mexico and that mother load of salt is referred to as the Luan salt. Uh, that occurred back in the Jurassic by the way uh, in the heyday of the dinosaurs. Here's a photograph showing a chert. This probably occurred as a replacement uh, in, in this situation. This is chert in limestone. And here is a photograph of the um, different um, types of, of coal. First off, we start with peat, which isn't coal at all, but we're looking at organic remains. And then we move um, through a little bit of alteration um, and uh, compaction, um, cementation to a certain degree, I guess we could call it, we end up with lignite, which is um, very um, low in alteration as far as coal is concerned. And it, um, it tends to burn pretty, um, pretty smokily, if you will. Uh, there's a lot of organic material, and you often find plant pieces in that lignite and moving down we can get to uh, bituminous coal which is also a sedimentary rock and coal can be further altered or metamorphose to form anthracite. Um, I brought a sample of lignite. Here's lignite and you can see it's it's very friable. I'm gonna make a mess here on the desk on my little arrow. <laughs> um, here we go and let me show you also I have a piece of um, this is bituminous coal this is the majority of coal type in the Appalachians as well as mined in the west, the western U.S. So bituminous is more uh, metamorphosed, um, has undergone more changes with heat and pressure than the lignite that I just showed you, but we can further metamorphose this to get a black shiny coal referred to as anthracite, and that is a metamorphic rock. Okay, let's talk a little bit about sedimentary facies. Um, a facies would be a body of sediment with a distinctive physical, chemical, and biological attribute. So if we look at a typical environment, and naturally the earth is not nice and neat. There are always exceptions and um, we always have to consider the source of sediments as well as the environment and what's going on with the organisms involved. But in general, if we look from the shoreline to the open water, the energy will decrease from the shoreline to the open water. So what we see being deposited closest to the shore are our sand-sized particles, and then farther out in calmer water, the shale can then slowly uh, drop out or, or um, fall out of solution and finally we end up with chemical precipitates like limestone forming. So sandstone environment, uh, formation of sandstone would occur closer to the shore than shale and then uh, we'd get limestone farther out toward open water. Here's a great diagram that summarizes that. Note that the rivers are uh, terminating into the ocean. So the river works about the same way we do. It's carrying a lot of different particles, um, either in suspension or in solution. So imagine you go to the store and um, you're quickly preparing for a Super Bowl party. You didn't realize your, your friends were coming over, so you're, last minute, you know, you quickly run in and you grab uh, three six packs and you grab um, four bags of chips. Well, you're quickly running through the line and the person who's bagging for you is not thinking and puts all the six packs in one paper bag and puts all the chips in the other paper bag. You're rushing out into the parking lot to get into your car to head back to the house and all of a sudden you run into that high school buddy you haven't seen in years and you start talking, holding one bag of six packs and one bag of chips in each arm. Well, as the conversation progresses to 10 minutes, 
after a while you start getting tired. So what bag are you going to put down first at your feet? You're going to put the six packs down. You may guard them with your life, but you're going to put those down first. And the river acts the same way. Okay, same analogy. The river will drop the heaviest particles first and then as the energy decreases, the finer particles can, can fall out. So we get the sand, uh, or if it has a lot of energy, we might even get gravel. We get uh, gravel, then sand, and then the clay sized stuff, the uh, silt sized stuff starts falling out, silt and clay in a mud facies. And finally, uh, when we get farther offshore, we get a carbonate facies. And this is where we have either biological precipitation or um, precipitation from a supersaturated solution. So remember this, it's very important. It will show up again and again and again, I guarantee you, in geology, in historical geology, and uh, you will find this in many, many different places. So this is a very important concept to learn. Now over time, sea level has not stayed the same. The sea level has risen with respect to the land and it has fallen with respect to the land. A marine transgression occurs when the water rises with respect to the land. Now, how do we know this has occurred if we weren't there to witness it? We can look at the rock record and see that the rock sequence from the bottom of the sequence to the top has changed. In other words, as the water rose, the sedimentary environment changed what was shallow water becomes deep water, becomes even deeper water, so the rock types that we see being deposited in that area have changed over time. And the vertical sequence from the bottom or the oldest to the top would fine upwards, as we say. In other words, we're getting from um, a larger grain size to a smaller grain size. So typically what we would see is sandstone on the bottom, shale, and then finally limestone on the top. And limestone would be um, the more recently deposited of those facies. So this diagram summarizes that, but keep in mind, let's start at the top. We're looking at the oldest environment in this diagram up at the top, okay? So um, look that from the shore, we have the sandstone moving out toward the shale to the left, moving out toward the limestone. Well, something's happened in the middle diagram, and the sea level has risen with respect to land. Notice that the, the waves breaking are now farther to the right in the middle diagram. So look how our facies have shifted. So if we're thinking in the middle, um, look how where we once were um, shale, for example, and now we're overlain by limestone. So the water's deeper. In the same location, the water is deeper because the water level is rising. So where we once had shale, we now have limestone. Look at the bottom block diagram and you see the water's rising even more, more recent. Rising even more and we see again the facies moving toward the shoreline. Now that bottom little block diagram shows you the fining upwards sequence. In other words, we have uh, on the old land surface, we have sand followed by shale followed by limestone. This fines upward. Okay, so look, the, the uh, limestone is a finer sedimentary rock than the shale. Shale has finer clasts than the sandstone. Now, as you might imagine, we can reverse this and we can have marine regressions. Regressions occur when the water falls with respect to the land, so the vertical sequence from bottom to top would be reversed and we would coarsen upward. So the rocks on the top would have a coarser detrital nature than the ones below. So instead of seeing sandstone on the bottom and limestone on the top, we flip it. We have limestone in the oldest environment, overlain by shale, overlain by sandstone. Let's take a look at this diagram. This is a regression. Note that the top um, block diagram is the oldest event. Look at the sea level. Wow, it's uh, really overlaying that continental crust there. Okay, so you see the sedimentary facies, the sand, 
closest to the land, then the shale, and then the carbonate or limestone. In the middle block diagram, C is falling. Well, look at the shift. Sand is now going to be shifted toward the open sea, then shale, then limestone. What's also occurring, uh, note that uh, that earlier sand is being exposed to weathering. So do you think it's going to stay around? Chances are those earlier layers uh, that are now exposed to atmospheric processes and weathering will be eroded away. Okay, they'll be weathered and eroded away. Look at that bottom block diagram and wow, that sea level's moved back even farther. So now where we once had an environment that um, was... Uh, was a deeper environment is now a shallower environment and we would have sand deposited where there was once shale. So the bottom block sequence, if we look at the old land surface, we first see limestone overlain by shale overlain by sandstone. Now what would happen if we started with um, let's say the uh, the sandstone? Well that's exposed. It's not covered by water so therefore we'll have an erosional surface and we won't have deposition. So we took our little block here where we had the earliest deposition but we still basically have some water as well. So again a regression where the sea level falls with respect to the land is showing up in the rock record as a coarsening up of sediments. So the bottom or earliest deposited tends to be a carbonate overlain by a shale and a shale overlain by a sandstone. So why does this occur? Well, there are many different ways that a transgression or a regression can be caused in the rock record. We can have uplift for example, a bulging uh, magma body underneath a continent can cause uplift, so the continent is rising with respect to the ocean. We can have subsidence of a continent as, um, let's say, ice or sediments accumulate on a co uh, continent, or there's compaction, we can have subsidence, so the continent falls with respect to sea level. There can be changes in rates of seafloor spreading. If we're producing more magma at the seafloor, for example, more oceanic crust is being formed, that newer crust is hot, it's less dense, it takes up more space in the ocean basins, causing the water level to rise. Glaciation is also linked with the rise and fall of the level of the oceans. If we add ice on the continents, we're tying up water in ice, taking it out of the ocean basins so the ocean basins fall with respect to the land. If, on the other hand, we see warmer climates, melting of glaciers, the water goes somewhere, it goes into the ocean, and therefore sea level rises with respect to the land. Now, let's shift gears a bit and take a look at the different types of sedimentary structures that uh, can be incorporated in sedimentary rocks. Sedimentary rocks are really, really interesting features and incorporate lots of different structures. Um, we can have the individual layers or the beds uh, showing up in the rock record. So when we talk about beds or the strata, we're talking about the layers of the rock that are separated by bedding planes. And I have a really neat example here to show you. Here's a sandstone, a quartz sandstone, and you can see the individual layers or the individual um, layers and bedding planes of this rock and what's really neat is that look at this it's at an angle so we may have had deposition of uh, of these layers at an angle or a cross bedding okay So cross beds or beds that are at an angle to the surface of deposition, they um, tend to be steep on the downward slope and gentle on the upward uh, slope. In other words, as wind moves over a surface or water moves over a surface, the direction of the water will have the more gentle slope. And as the water moves over the surface and uh, forms this cross bed, it tends to have a steeper slope in the uh, downward direction. Uh, great reason to be a geologist. You get to go out in the field and have uh, 
field camp and, and student experiences. Um, this was taken on a, um, a field camp at another institution that um, I, I was at at the time. And you can see in the background the layers, the bedding planes of the different sedimentary rocks. These are sandstones. Again, um, look on the left-hand side. You see the wind or the current direction coming from the left. See the gentle slope in the up current direction. And then as the sediments move up, 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 and then they, uh, they reach an angle of repose and are deposited on the downward slope. And that tends to be at a steeper angle. This is National Bridges um, National Monument in Utah, and these are um, ancient cross beds that are preserved uh, in sandstone. This is wind formed uh, cross bedding. And what direction do you think the wind blew? If you said from the left, you are correct. It moved from the left, and the um, the down steep slope is off to the right. Another type of sedimentary structure is that of graded bedding. Graded bedding is an upward decrease in grain size within a bed. Now we're not talking about a, a transgression or a regression here because in a transgression or a regression we're talking about different sedimentary facies that overlie each other. Graded bedding is the decrease the upward decrease in the grain size within an individual bed. Okay, So these form in deep water environments because of turbidity currents or underwater sediment flows. So here we are looking cross-sectionally underwater. Uh, look at the continental shelf that's going to be, boy that's a pretty steep representation. It's usually a much gentler slope than that. Okay, so we have the continental shelf off to the upper right hand corner and then we have the continental slope and that tends to be a, a fairly steep slope that um, is the intermediate between the shelf and the deep water. Uh, we have a continental rise in passive margins where there's no subduction going on. If there's subduction going on, we don't have the rise at all. We have a trench. And then we get to the abyss or the deep water. So note that um, you know right there on uh, kind of at that dotted line um, that moves across the diagram, look right below that. You know, you have a, a body of sediment accumulation there, and then it's at the edge of that steeper continental slope. Well, along that continental slope we can have those sediments become uh, super saturated, they become unstable, and they move slow, uh, not slowly, excuse me, rapidly downhill in a turbidity current. And then as the turbidity current uh, slows and stops, the sediments fall out. Well, how do they fall out? Okay, imagine going to a local river or a stream in your area and taking a, a glass mason jar and scoop up a sample of water um, as well as some of the sediments on the bottom of that riverbed. Okay, um, put the top on it and shake it up. So you're going to have a chaotic mixture of water and gravel and sand and silt all mixed up with uh, the shaking action. Put that glass mason jar on a desk or a table and watch what happens. Well, almost immediately, as soon as you stop shaking, the gravel is going to wind up at the bottom. It's going to settle out quickly because of gravity. And then you'll see sand uh, falling out pretty rapidly as well. The water is probably still cloudy though. If you leave it and you don't touch it and you don't shake it up and you wait two or three days and you come back, you notice that the water is noticeably clearer and covering the top of that sand layer are finer clay particles. The clay takes a while to slowly settle out of that solution. So that's what graded bedding is. As that turbidity current slows and comes to a stop, it deposits the heavier stuff first, the sands, and then slowly as it loses energy, the finer and finer sediments are deposited on top. Here we see a graded bed. See the heavier stuff on the bottom? followed by the finer stuff and the very fine stuff on top. Now we don't always get something as nice and neat as, as gravel and sand and clay. Sometimes we are looking at um, a, a decrease in, in sand size as we move up through the bed. 
We can also see uh, ripple marks that are preserved as sedimentary structures. Uh, ripple marks can be caused uh, in sands as well as in, uh, in wave or longshore currents. Here we see, um, oh, I'm sorry, we also are going to look at mud cracks uh, before we get to that next picture. And mud cracks, of course, occur in a desiccating or drying out environment. Okay, now let's take a look at some of these ripple marks. Here we have um, a river and you can see ripples. Now remember, we tend to have a steeper slope on um, the down current direction. So in which direction do you think that current is flowing? Okay. Now that is in a water environment. Here is a uh, sand environment. And um, the shadows here are, are kind of neat, but I think we're seeing the, um, the current, the wind current, as emanating from the left. Okay, now what's going on in this picture? These are wave currents, so not only do we have something in one direction, but we have this back and forth action, so our uh, ripple marks are going to be symmetrical. Take a look at this. This is a slab of rock. What do you think formed this? Do we see a river or wind? Ah, if you guessed wave action because of those symmetrical ripple marks, you are correct. In arid environments, we see mud cracks forming. These can be preserved in the rock record as well. Um, these are mud cracks that are preserved in Glacier National Park in Montana. Uh, note that those uh, desiccation cracks have been filled in with sediment and then lithification proceeded. So we don't uh, have the crack anymore, but we do have um, we do have an infilling of cracks preserving the original mud crack. Now, one reason I like sedimentary rocks is because of fossils. Fossil inclusion is found in sedimentary rocks most of the time. Um, well, let me take that back and reword it. Um, if we're looking at which rock type fossils are most prevalent, those are the sedimentary rocks. Um, and that's because the fossils or the organism remains are incorporated as the sediments are being deposited and as that sedimentary rock is being formed. There are some cases of metamorphic rocks having uh, fossils in them, but of course they're distorted <laughs> from metamorphosed sedimentary rocks. And um, we can also have some igneous rocks with fossils as long as the um, the rock, uh, as it was cooling, incorporated the fossil and didn't totally melt and incorporate the original organism. Fossils are simply the remains or traces of past um, life forms, and they can be body fossils, which are the remains of the original organism, or they can be uh, trace fossils. And trace fossils aren't part of the organism that are preserved, but are part of the organism's activity that is preserved. For example, um, burrows or tracks show movement of the organism or feeding of the organism, but don't preserve the organism itself. Now, fossils can indicate an environment of deposition, and fossilization can take place in many different types of ways. Um, for example, um, not all organisms are equally preserved. It helps if you have hard parts, if you're rapidly buried and there is a low oxygen content to inhibit decay of the original organic material. We see different types of fossiliz fossilization processes. Um, we can have something called unaltered remains, and this is where the original, the original material is preserved, and of course that's you know, every paleontologist's dream. Um, we can have fossils that are permineralized or have minerals added to the fossil, uh, the organism over time in preservation, and we can have casts and molds. Uh, for example, if the original um, fossil is dissolved out, we have an impression left behind in the rock, and that's a cast, and if that is later infilled with sediments, we have a mold. And I brought just a few samples to show you. Here is a piece of amber 
Remember, it's not a mineral because it's not, it's uh, the organic remains of uh, fossilized uh, sap. So it's a fossil in and of itself, and there are some little insect inclusions as well. There's a little bitty um, cricket in this one. Okay, and I also have, let's see, um, this is a permineralized fossil. This is a brachiopod from the Ordovician. It looks like a clam, but it's not. It's as different from a clam as a uh, clam is different from a, um, a trilobite or an insect. So this is really heavy. And um, over time, I mean, the Ordovician was many hundreds of millions of years ago, um, different minerals have been added to the original material, and we now have addition of uh, minerals through groundwater and the like, and this is permineralized. We probably have a little bit of permineralization occurring in this as well. Uh, this is a type of oyster. It's Adurostrea focata. It's an oyster that's found in our area in Storkville. It's Cretaceous. And uh, there are both valves there. Isn't it cute? Um, we probably have a lot of original material, but because this is Cretaceous, we're looking at something 70 million years old, um, minerals have probably been added to this as well. There's some, a little bit of permineralization occurring. And finally, I'm going to show you a mold and cast of one of my favorite organisms. Um, this is a trilobite, or is it? Well, let's, let's show him this way. Okay, so the original trilobite um, is preserved here as a cast. It dissolved out. We don't have um, permineralized fossil or um, original material or, or replacement. Instead, the original uh, trilobite was dissolved from the rocks, leaving behind a cavity, and this fossil type is called a cast, and then later on was infilled with sediments, and we get a mold. So here we have a cast, and here we have a mold. Okay. Our trilobite. We can also uh, look at uh, microfossils in the rock record, and these are really, really important um, because there's so many of them. They're useful for environmental studies. Uh, we drill cores to find out what lies below the surface, and we don't always run into a dinosaur bone or a clam, for that matter, but uh, we find lots of microfossils that are incorporated in the rock record. Okay, here's some photographs of amber and a mammoth preserved in, um, this one was actually frozen in a Siberian lake, so this is unaltered. And here we have some um, different types of fossils. We have uh, Mr. Uh, dinosaur and uh, we have some ammonites in the upper right hand corner. There is a coprolite, and I brought you my favorite coprolite to show. Yay! This is an, uh, an Eocene turtle, um, and it's uh, been identified as a turtle, not by me, um, but the uh, perpetrator, or as one of my students called it, a poopetrator, um, this has been identified by the anal scale markings uh, left behind on the coprolite sample. That's a trace fossil. It's not the original material. Trace fossils can also be tracks. And in the slide, um, the bottom photograph shows a little tracks, impressions left behind. Sedimentary rocks are resources and can contain resources. We've uh, mentioned some of these, sand and gravel for building. Um, clay can be used for ceramics. Evaporite, salt, gypsum. Gypsum is used for sheetrock. We have coal. Um, we have placer deposits as well, uh, accumulation of metals when the, um, the less heavy stuff is washed away. California Gold Rush uh, placer deposits were being uh, panned in the rivers. Uh, sedimentary rocks can also be great reservoirs of petroleum. We have, um, we have to have a body that can hold a fluid. It has to be porous. We have to have permeability in that body so it can transmit the fluid. And we need a cap rock to keep the fluids from escaping. Otherwise, we might end up with the Beverly Hillbillies up from the ground come a bubble and crude. Okay, and this diagram shows some different types of reservoirs. We have some uh, stratigraphic traps where different rock layers can trap the petroleum. We have structural traps where we have um, the uh, fault or sometimes an anticline will trap the petroleum. And um, salt makes a great 
uh, structural trap as well because salt rises, it's of low density, and it um, goes ahead and um, kind of messes up the sediments and the, um, the oil permeates upwards and is trapped against the salt. Okay, we can also see oil shales being used. They contain kerogen, which can, uh, you can extract petroleum, banded iron formations, and uranium. Okay, that marks the end of our lecture today on sedimentary rocks. There's a picture of oil shale. If you have any questions, here's a banded iron formation. If you have any questions, please feel free to post them or email your instructor. Thank you so much for joining me today.